So we're going to go straight away to Ali Bloom, who is a research associate with the UK Data Service at the University of Manchester, and her role pro involves providing support and training to researchers who want to understand, access and utilise social science data. So we do have four presentations which are going to be fairly quick in this session, so I'm going to be strict and keep people to time um, so that we finish on time. Thanks, Ali. Over to you. Great. Thanks, Vanessa. So as Vanessa said, uh, I'm Ali Bloom from the UK Data Service User Support and Training Team. And in this session, I'm going to be giving um, a quick introduction to some of our learning resources, which can help you explore health data and the other data we have available. Can I just check, are my slides up on the screen? Have we got that? Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Just good to check before we get started. So in this talk, I'm going to be covering um, the UK Data Service Learning Hub. I'm going to be covering our training and events page, which I'm sure some of you might be familiar with, as it might be how you booked onto this conference. I'm also going to be talking about places you can find our key health data sets, how you can search for data by a particular type, and then give a quick brief introduction to our YouTube channel as well. So starting with the UK Data Service Learning Hub. The UK Data Service Learning Hub is a central point for access to um, our learning resources and data skills training. So you can find it on our website by clicking on the tab at the top that says Learning Hub. Once you head here, you'll see different tiles that are targeted to different data skills and training needs. So for example, we have our new to using data tile uh, that's targeted to new users or students or anyone who might be getting started with data. We've got the data skills modules, which I'll come back to in just a second. Um, we also have dedicated tiles for particular data types. So survey data, international data, qualitative data. We've also got a dedica dedicated section on census data and also geography and data. So that's data that you might want to use for mapping, um, using for perhaps the census or um, longitudinal studies, as it says here. We've also got another set of web pages on software and tools. So this will teach you how to use the software, such as our online tools. So things like Nestar, QualiBank, which allows you to search qualitative data sets by key terms, and UKDS.stat that lets you look at um, international aggregate data, and also our training on traditional um, ways of uh, analyzing data. So things like programming languages such as R and Python, and packages such as Stata and SPSS. We've also got a section on computational social science. So this gives you information on newer methods or new technologies and resources. So things such as um, modeling or uh, Twitter data or scraping tweets and how you analyze those. We have another section on teaching with data. So, for example, if you're wanting to get started with an open access teaching data set. In terms of health, we've got some um, NatSAL data sets. Um, and resources around those that are useful if you're wanting to teach about health as well. And our data skills modules, which I said I'd come back to. So these modules are interactive modules designed to allow you to learn about the key um, types of data. So we've got one on survey data, one on longitudinal data, and one on aggregate data. And we also have our beta module on exploring crime surveys with R, but that's still in development at the minute. If you click on this module, it takes you to where it's hosted in our online platform. You can work through this module um, at your own time from the beginning to the end, or you can choose particular sections that you're interested in. So if I click start course, I'll just give you a bit of a brief idea um, about what these modules look like. So they're a combination of text, videos, um, interactive quizzes. We've got quizzes like this where you can check your understanding at the end, um, just to take you through understanding different types of survey data if you're getting started. And if I scroll right down to the bottom, you'll also see there's an assessment and a certificate of completion that you can do at the end as well. So I'm just going to navigate back to talk about the training and events page. So this can be found at the top here. Um, as I said, some of you might have already accessed this and be familiar with this. So from this page, you can search all of our upcoming training and events. You can filter by particular topics. So, for example, if I filter by health, we'll see that the health studies uh, conference today comes up. 
You can also filter by type category and whether training is face-to-face -face or online, although most of our training at the minute is still online. And also um, whether it's upcoming or a past event. And past events are useful to search for because we host all of the past materials and recordings of our events on these past event pages as well. And you can also view by calendar um, if you're interested in looking for an event that happened on a particular date. If you are looking for data on a particular topic, so for example, health, if you go to find data at the top, then click on browse and access data, you can browse data by theme here. If we click on health, this will take you to our health theme page, which brings together some of our popular key data sets on the theme of health. So for example, we've got the Adult Dental Health Sur Survey, ELSA, NATSAL, which I mentioned earlier, um, Understanding Society, and links to some of the census data as well, which could help you if you're trying to visualize some of the health data. If you want to view all of the data for health, if you click on view all data up here, it'll take you to our data catalog where you can search um, for data. If you want more information on how to search the catalog in detail, the pinned page on our YouTube channel. Uh, the pinned video on our YouTube channel goes through that um, and I'll demonstrate that in a second. So watch that if you want a bit more information on how to, um, yeah, how to search the catalogue. You can also search by topic. So if you click on health, you'll be able to see um, health data that's specific to that. You can also uh, search by data type. So if you're interested in longitudinal data to look at health, how health changes over time, you can click on this um, and it'll filter by that as well. Another way to search by data type, which I'll just quickly show you before I move on to the YouTube channel, is again to go to find data and browse data. And if you scroll down and click on, for example, longitudinal studies, if, like I said, you were interested in looking at health over time, it will take you to the catalogue with the filter for longitudinal studies selected. Ali, you've just got one minute left. Brill, thank you, Vanessa. The final thing that I want to highlight is our YouTube channel. So here you can find video tutorials that highlight topics such as how to use our online tools, like the ones I mentioned earlier, Nestar, or information on how to download things like boundary data. Um, we also have training playlists. So these are themed by topics. So for example, if you wanted all the information on accessing data or citing data or computational social science. And we also have all of our past events playlists as well. So if you're looking for a recording event like this um, and you want to watch it back, that can be found on our YouTube channel as well. Um, that concludes the presentation. Um, Brilliant, thanks Ali. Um, yeah. I'm not seeing any Q and questions in the Q&A box. Um, so I think just for the sake of time, we'll move on to our next speaker and we can deal with questions as we go along then. Great, so, thanks Vanessa. Um, okay, Bethan, would you like to put your slides up and I'll introduce you. Um, so Bethan is a principal information asset owner at NHS Digital. She's been at NHS Digital for over 10 years and is senior member of the Data Access Request Service. Bethan leads the team that focuses on commissioning applications and is also the IAO, I'm not sure what that stands for, for a number of assets, including the NHS Digital Survey data sets. So over to you, Bethan. Hey, Vanessa, can you see my slides okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, so I'll, um, an IAO is an information asset owner. So it's a role that was created after GDPR to make sure that within public sector organisations, we are utilising assets to the best of their capacity, but doing it legally and appropriately. Um, so I've got 20 slides today, don't worry, I'm not gonna talk through all of them. And um, the last four or five slides are just some extra information should you want to find out anything further about NHS Digital and DARS. So um, let's see if I can get that to move on. Okay, so who are we? We're NHS Digital. We are the National Information and Technology Partner to the Health and Care System. And our mission is to harness the power of information and technology to make health and care better. Um, currently, we're a standalone organisation. By, by this time next year, we will have merged into NHS England. So what's DARS? DARS is the Data Access Request Service. And this is the, the team, the people who facilitate access to health and social care data for organisations such as clinical research bodies, academia, commissioners, the CCGs, and occasionally commercial companies. 
The Darnstein's role is there to ensure that access to the personal data is done in a legal way, that it's done within the IG requirements, that it's being held securely, and that it's being used to improve health and care services. And paramount is it's not used solely for commercial purposes. Um, some key information about DARS is we process more than a thousand applications for NHS digital data each year, and over half of those are from researchers. We have a 70 data sets available to request from DARS, and the majority of them cover England, but we do have a few that cover the devolved nations. Many assets can be linked to other data sets or to cohort data that researchers provide, and we also now offer a clinical trial service, which can help identify an appropriate cohort of patients for a planned clinical trial, can provide contact details for contact or contact candidates for a trial and provide updates on the chosen cohort of patients. As you can imagine, that service has been incredibly busy over the last two years with the pandemic. So specifically, the survey data sets. Um, we have our normal standard data sets like HAIRS, mental health, IAPS and things like that, which take data from the hospitals and clinicians. And then we have the surveys, which are taken from people's respondents' homes, interviews, postal online surveys. They're much smaller, um, but the depth of questions can often be quite much broader. And our surveys look into a range of issues around health, lifestyle, mental health, behaviours and choices. And I'm not going to go into much detail on the surveys because I imagine most of you are aware of a lot of them. But if you want to find out any more about them, there's a link on the slides to our website. So and this is just a quick list of all the slides that we have, um, sorry, all the survey data sets that we have available via the UK data service currently. Um, there's quite a range, as you can see, but there's a huge amount of data out there all available. And later on in the slides, I'll give a quick update on what we still have outstanding and what we're working on currently. So as Jenny said, yes, um, she's correct. There are two ways of accessing the data for most of the data assets through the UK data service. There's the end user license, which means you don't need to go for more um, approvals, or there's a special user license. For some of the assets, that can just be done via the UK Data Service and the IAO. Um, it means it comes to me, the UK Data Service sent it to me to approve it. Or some of them, so for APMS and the mental health of children and younger people, that needs to go through a DARS application and a data sharing agreement. There's also the opportunity to request bespoke versions of data, but they can take a little bit more time as they need to go through all the necessary approvals and we need to get the survey organisations involved with producing those. Um, and this is just a, a quick snapshot of what we have available currently by the UK, UKDS. Okay, um, so how do you access the assets? Um, like we said, for the end user licence, go up to the UK, the UKDS, apply that way, it's the way to get in. Um, and that's why if you want the special user license for HSE as well. If you want the special user license for mental health, children and young people and APMS, that's going through a DARS application. And these are the steps here of how you go through to do it. Um, the first, the best thing I can suggest is if you want to go through that process, get in touch with the inquiries mailbox and one of the team will be able to talk you through it and help you and support you through it. Um, and if you're wanting a bespoke request, then please get in touch with the surveys team directly. And what's our progress today? Well, we've done loads of work over the last few years getting the data sets live, but we are a bit delayed at the moment on some of them and getting them out in the UK data service. And that's predominantly due to the COVID priorities and the COVID impact on the teams. Um, so the mental health of children and younger people, we've got three follow-up surveys, the 2017 cohort, they've taken place. And the data sets will be available soon. Um, smoking and drinking drugs in younger people, the 2021 data set will be available later this year. Um, HSC work is ongoing for the HSC 16 and 17. And we're also working on an ethnicity data set. And um, there's a plan to have a secondary but slightly reduced data set for the APMS, um, which I assume will be making available under end user license. Um, and how are we trying to make things better for you as researchers and as customers for the service? Well, what we've got is we have a precedent approved for DARS. That means that for certain types of applications, um, we don't have to take it through the full DARS process. We've already pre-got some of the approvals in place, obviously subject to you having the, national, the necessary legal basis in place as well. Um, there are some limitations around that. Can only be for not-for-profit research or education 
can't be identifiable data. And if it's for a commercial request, even if everything else fits within our precedent, then it would still go through the standard iGuard approval. And for anyone who's unaware, iGuard is our independent um, assurance review group who are a collection of lay people and specialists who are independent from the NHS Digital and review our phototypes and more um, complex or complicated data sharing agreement requests. So we can get an independent viewpoint on um, what they think about the application and is it fit for purpose and is it suitable? Um, so we're also working with them to look at what we can do about improving the approval pathways for the HSE blood blank, the data linkage to non-NHS digital data sets, the bespoke data requests, and to recontact cohorts for follow-on research. And that's all I was going to say, Vanessa. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, so there aren't any further questions. So um, we'll thank Bethan and we'll move on to our third speaker, who is Neil Kay. Um, Bethan, do you want to stop sharing and then Neil can share his slides? Hi, Neil. Hi. Do you want to share your slides and I'll introduce you? Um, so Neil Kay is a research fellow at CLOSER, which aims to increase the visibility, use and impact of longitudinal population studies, data and research. He leads CLOSER's training and capacity building activities, overseeing the development of online learning resources aimed at students, researchers and policymakers. So you have 10 minutes, including questions, Neil, so fire away. Okay, thanks, Vanessa. Yes, um, so today I'm going to talk about um, CLOSA's Learning Hub and introduce how it can be used uh, in, in your research. Uh, I'm going to quickly talk a little bit about CLOSA itself and what we do, uh, followed by uh, a very quick introduction to, the, to our Learning Hub, show you what the CLOSA Learning Hub looks like, and then towards the end of the presentation, um, show you how to get started effectively and give you a flavor of some of the very helpful animations that we've had commissioned um, which will um, hopefully help you to navigate around the the learning hub uh, and to get what um, what you want to get out of it so first of all closer who are we most of you hopefully will have heard of us at least uh, and we're an interdisciplinary partnership uh, we have 19 of the leading social and biomedical longitudinal population studies um, as partner studies, uh, as well as the UK Data Service and the British Library. And we have this mission to increase the visibility, use and impact of longitudinal population, the studies, the data that comes out of the studies and, and really kind of promoting uh, research using that data. We have several core areas of work um, and many of you will know about several different parts of that, not least the Closer Discovery search engine, other projects and partnerships we have, policy and public affairs and dialogue uh, and other projects in terms of uh, data linkage and data harmonization. But the uh, Closer Learning Hub that I'm going to talk about today is really our flagship product um, coming off of our um, training and capacity building strand. So the uh, Closer's Learning Hub is very much aimed at newcomers to longitudinal research. It's very beginner friendly. Uh, you know, it's really aimed at students or, or academics and, and analysts who are not necessarily um, familiar with longitudinal population studies. Uh, and so it helps you to kind of navigate what they are, how to explore them and put your research skills into practice. And the way it does this is it kind of sets out uh, the information in a set by step process, mirroring, mirroring the, the process of, of answering a research question. So, for example, you can use the Learning Hub to think about, you know, how you can use data from these studies in your research, what kinds of questions you can answer with this type of data, uh, and as well, you know, where you can access the data, how you can analyze the data, uh, and the different ways that your research can, can really progress throughout, um, throughout that process. So if you're unfamiliar, what does the, the Learning Hub look like? Well, this is the kind of homepage. It gives you an overview of, of the longitudinal population studies. And from here, you can access the different areas of the site on the top bar. Uh, it's divided into four main areas. The, the learning modules is where the bulk of the, the information and different, uh, uh, on different themes is located. Uh, and that will drop down and you'll be able to navigate through, through that heading. Uh, 
teaching resources. Uh, if you're not a student, but instead a tutor, and you're trying to uh, trying to impart this information to your students, which I can recommend to everyone to do. Uh, some more kind of teacher friendly resources uh, and formats for the for the information are provided through that section. In addition to, we have access to a couple of training data sets as well there. Uh, and then we have uh, research case studies, uh, which uh, give a real world application of how uh, some of this research uh, using longitudinal population studies data has been done uh, and explore by topic section uh, and, uh, and a glossary, which I think is hugely beneficial, especially for, for people coming without a, a familiarity of a lot of the terminology. So, um, if you if you get access to these slides, this link will take you to the the full um, the full introductory getting started video. But what I'm going to try and do now is um, show you the learning hub. Hopefully, you can see that, and we'll, you'll see we've got this additional um, getting started tab at the top, which will take you to. Uh, Yes, the, the videos, the, the getting started animations, uh, which are helpfully divided into, into six parts, which cover a whole range of, of different areas of the Learning Hub site. And even more ambitiously, I'm going to try and show you just a couple of these animations. They're not very long, but just to give you a flavor. The Learning Hub is divided into four main areas. Learning modules, teaching resources, research case studies, and an explore by topic section. There is also an extensive glossary available in the top right-hand corner to provide a more detailed explanation of some of the more complex terms. The learning modules contain information, videos, and interactive quizzes in six thematic subsections. The first two of these are useful in providing an overview of what longitudinal research is, how longitudinal data are collected, and why longitudinal data are particularly valuable for answering important research questions. Longitudinal studies share a common aim to examine change over time and to capture events in people's lives as they age. To this end, a longitudinal study is a prospective observational study that follows the same people over a period of time, repeatedly collecting information from them. They differ from cross-sectional studies, which interview a fresh sample of people each time they are carried out. Many longitudinal studies collect a broad range of information about different areas of their participants' lives. This makes them incredibly valuable when looking at the way different aspects of our lives interact and how early life circumstances or characteristics relate to outcomes in adulthood, middle age, or later life. To learn more about using data from longitudinal studies in your research, visit the Closer Learning Hub. As you begin to consider your research topic, you may already know what research question you would like to answer, or you may have a broad area of interest that you would like to investigate further. In any case, you may be in search of a little inspiration to set you on the way. Longitudinal studies provide a rich source of social science and biomedical data and can be used to answer a whole range of research questions. The Learning Hub provides research case studies, each of which detail a piece of published academic research using longitudinal study data. The case studies currently available on the Learning Hub cover topic areas including social media and well-being, ethnic differences in unemployment, the rise of the obesity epidemic, and childhood bullying. The case studies provide examples of real-world research, outlining the research questions asked, the study and data used, what the key findings of the analysis were, and what implications these might have for policy or further research. The case studies also discuss the advantages of using longitudinal data to explore the topic in question. CLOSER aims to regularly add new research case studies to the Learning Hub to provide an even broader range of examples to demonstrate how longitudinal research has been applied in real-world settings. To learn more about using data from longitudinal studies in your research, visit the CLOSER Learning Hub.
terrific. That's all I had to say. And um, any questions uh, about the Learning Hub, happy or about Closer more generally, I'm happy to take. Thank you, Neil. And we'll move on to our next and final speaker of the day, um, who is Nazir Rajar. And Nazir, do you want to put up your slides and I will introduce you. So Nazir is a research fellow at UCL Centre for Longitudinal Studies. His recent work has focused on administrative linked cohort data and his broader research interests lie in the economic effects of ill health. So you have slightly longer actually, you have 10 minutes plus the questions and answers. So, um, so I'll pop up when you're about two minutes towards the end of your presentation and um, take it away. Yes, uh, my name is Nasir. I work with uh, Dr. Richard Silverwood, who I think some of you might have met earlier. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to be going through the work we've been doing on the linked uh, hospital web cell statistics data and how we can use that to aid the handling of missing data. I've got 10 minutes, like you said, so I'll try to be um, speedy. Um, there we go. Uh, some of the co-investigators on the grant as well, Lisa George from CLS and Bianca and Katie, from um, QCL. So just a brief outline of what I'm going to go through today, a bit of a background, um, then to go over some of the data, the NCDS data, the recent HES linkage, um, and then onto the work we've been doing to identify predictors of non-response using the HES data, um, and then restoring the NCDS sample representativeness, which are some preliminary results, um, and then some conclusions. Bit of background. Um, so non-response is quite common in longitudinal surveys. I think one of the biggest issues um, in regard to non-response is the introduction of bias because people who respond tend to be fundamentally different from people who don't respond. So in some of the work we've seen um, in other longitudinal data, uh, people who are from an ethnic minority background are less likely to respond as time goes on. Um, the same with um, uh, education as well. So people who are more highly educated are more likely to respond. So um, there's a, this is the analytical strategy. Um, there's a growing interest in whether linked admin data has the potential to aid analysis um, subject to missing data and cohort studies. Uh, so we want to identify the predictors of cohort non-response in linked administrative data and explore whether it adds any value to those already, to the identified variables, um, adds value in including identified variables as auxiliary variables um, with respect to restoring sample representativeness. So today we are going to focus on the National Child Development Study and the health episode statistics from NHS Digital. So these are the two data sets. I'm sure some of you might be familiar with this data set. Um, if you're not, it's actually a really cool data set. Um, it's a long tuna birth cohort study that tracks all babies born in um, a single week in Great Britain in 1958, initially just under 17 and a half thousand, and it was later augmented by immigrants born in the same target week. Um, it spans a, a wider range of topics, uh, economic circumstances, social participation, family life, um, health, et cetera. Um, onto the health um, hospital episode statistics data. It's a collection of database containing interactions with the NHS hospitals in England only. Um, and there are, it's broken down to four databases. So the admitted patient care, critical, critical care, accident emergency, and outpatient appointments. Um, and Unfortunately, well, fortunately, I guess there aren't too many people in the critical care, so we don't actually use that data or any of the variables that come from that. Um, so the data, the data that includes uh, the dates, the diagnoses, procedures, patient demographics, uh, hospital characteristics for each hospital uh, episodes. Um, there can often be multiple episodes per admission, um, and the data, the availability of the data differ slightly. Uh, the APC comes from 97. The outpatient is from 2003, the a &E from 2007, and the critical care, as I mentioned, we didn't use, but it's from 2009. Um, the linkage between the NCDS and the data sets in the HES uh, was undertaken on the basis of consent at um, age 50, which was sweep eight. Uh, this is just a flowchart to um, uh, give an overview of how we went about our analytical strategy. Um, I just go over it quickly at the top, top headline figures. Um, there's just over a little, little over 18,500 people. Uh, we then limit to those who, people who lived in England in wave six and wave nine. Um, in the wave nine target population, um, those people are still alive and living in the UK. Um, and then the linkage consenters at wave eight who have pre-2013 HES data. 
Um, it's important to use pre-2013 HERS data because that is when the NCDS survey variables are picked up. So it's around 2013, 12, no, 2012. Um, and then onto the HERS predictors of non-response. Um, uh, so we initially derived the variables from the HES APC, the outpatient and a &E, uh, and then we derived 58 variables relating to uh, number, number of admissions and appointments, missed appointments, uh, the investigations undertaken, uh, the diagnosis, which includes ICD chapters, um, so that's quite a formalized process, uh, the treatment received. Um, we assume that if the cohort member, cohort member was eligible for um, linkage and consented to linkage, but didn't have any linked data, they truly didn't have a relevant interaction with the NHS. Um, so, for example, in the APC, if they didn't receive a diagnosis of something, we would just code that as not having received the diagnosis rather than it being missing. So the strategies that we, the uh, technique that we used was um, least absolute shrinkage and selection operator, bit of a mouthful, uh, shortened to lasso on the identified HES variable. So we start with 58. Uh, the lasso removes the variables that are not influential in predicting non-response at age 55. Uh, we use a penalty the lambda value that's determined by cross-validation using tenfolds. Um, so yeah, that is essentially um, where we split the data into a random 10 chunks and run different lambda values. And it, it selects the lambda value that gives the minimum mean cross-validated error. In this instance, it's the min minimum misclassification error. Um, and after the lasso is completed, uh, we have these variables um, that were selected, so 10 variables that were selected, uh, number of any appointments, um, treatment for adult mental illness, uh, proportion of points missed in outpatients, and there are five ICD chapters. So one of those, for example, is ICD chapter four, endocrine, nutritional, and metabolic diseases, uh, two operation codes in APC. So one of those is operation code T, soft tissue. Um, and restoring NCDS sample representativeness. Um, and so we took this into two, uh, two approaches. First, we want to see how well does, how well does, um, how well do the, the HES variables do in predicting, um, in restoring sample representativeness. We can only do that in amongst HES linkage consensus. And so this wouldn't be typically what you do in Europe in your own research, but we wanted to know how well does it work because amongst the whole cohort, there are people who have um, not consented to health linkage. So they don't have any information on HES. So it wouldn't be right to use that same approach in assessing the quality ability of HES variables to restore sample representativeness. So I've broken that down into two. So on this slide, uh, on this slide here, this is amongst the HES consensus only. Um, so there's quite a lot to unpack here. Um, on the um, y-axis, we have the estimate. So that is the, the cognitive ability at age seven for the NCDS individuals. And then we have the analytical steps that we've taken here. So we begin with the amongst all respondents at age seven, which would be about 14,400 people. And then amongst the target population at age 55, which is just under 13,000. 13, um, this is the bias introduced by being a HES consenter, by consenting to HES. Um, and that's the target sample in this analysis. This is what we want to restore back to. This would be the reference point. Um, and this is the bias introduced by being a consenter and also a wave nine respondent. These are the three approaches to which multiple mutation, which we run 20 times, um, and we'll run a little more later on. Um, this is the extent to which it can restore sample representativeness. Um, you can see using the has only variables, the multiple mutation um, doesn't add that much relative to uh, the survey variables, which do quite well um, in restoring sample representativeness. You can see that um, it's close to the reference value there and the survey has variables. Again, that's difficult to say because um, the survey variables have done quite well. Um, and then this is amongst the whole target population and perhaps what you might do in your own research. Here it's not possible to assess the, the ability of has only predictors to restore sample representativeness. Um, so here, this is amongst all respondents, again, 14,407 um, amongst the target population. If you were to take only wave nine respondents, this would be their um, the bias introduced by that. Um, and you can see using the previously identified survey variables, um, it restores sample representativeness. It's not possible to determine how well has variables do if, uh, in this regard, because the survey variables have already done quite well um, in restoring sample representativeness. So conclusions. Um, so we identified has variables which are predictive of non-response at wave nine. Uh, when cohort members are 55 years old. Um, we've incorporated these variables as auxiliary variables in the multi-implementation analysis. 
it's had relatively limited impact in restoring sample represent representativeness. Um, I mean, we didn't really find an additional gain relative to using only the survey predictors um, that CLS already has. Um, whilst this finding may not extend to other analysis or NCDS sweeps, it, it does highlight how well the utility of survey variables in handling non-response, and that's quite useful because one that's much easier to get than going through the um, process with NHS Digital of obtaining um, licenses, et cetera, and going through the training. Um, it's quite e much easier to get the survey variables and it's easily implemented in standard software. Um, so in this analysis, we used R. Um, and some references, and um, this work was funded by the SLC and the CLS the SLC grant. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, went through that quite quickly. So if you have any questions, please just let me know.